Welcome, everyone, to the Reformed Confessional Podcast. My name is John Fry, and it is September 2023. As always, Reformed Confessional exists to promote Reformed Confessionalism, to proclaim the sufficiency of Scripture, and to extol the supremacy of Christ over all things, and all things indeed our Creator reigns and rules, and Lord, for that we are very thankful to you. And also, to each and every one of you listening, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to continue in our series together, Getting to Know Our Great God. If you're not caught up or familiar with the series, you can go back to episode 11 of this podcast, put me in two times, and you'll catch up twice as fast to everyone else. And really what we've been doing is simply utilizing the Westminster Larger Catechism, shout out to the Westminster Larger, as a guide to both ask and then answer the question, what is God? Again, the goal of this series is that we would get to know God according to his character, who he is, and then worship him according to his desires. Before we get going full steam, I'll remind you that when Brother Nick Myers joins me on the podcast, from time to time we like to do a series called What We're Reading. And I'd like to pause to let you know what I've been reading and make a recommendation to you. This book here is titled Among the Vesper Spires, and the subtitle is Eternally in Joy for a Day's Exercise on the Earth by Pastor Gregory Graybill. It ties in very well with our current series because we've been zoomed in looking at Westminster Larger Catechism Question 7, which asks, What is God? Well, this book utilizes the material from the Westminster Larger Catechism Questions 1 through 90 to provide very rich theology, very well-explained and well-rooted apologetic equipping for the saint, but also it is literarily excellent. It is very rich from the imagery and vocabulary that is present within here, and that's because Pastor Gregory Gabriel takes this really, really interesting approach, and I'm really reading something that I've, I've never seen in such uh, a format that it both has a a literary feature that you could on one hand call fiction, but because the dialogue between characters is so theologically sound that you really can't call it fiction. It's full of God's word and God's truth. Really quickly, before we get going on, the book has two characters here, a philosophy professor named Dante who awakens in a dream and he and he simply cannot escape, and an angel who we come to know as Felix engages him about the things of God. Now, between their conversation is where you find the theological richness, the literary splendor, and the apologetic equipping that I have previously mentioned. Dante has an agnostic, atheistic type view, and he asks a lot of questions that modern-day Western civilization asks and argues against the very existence of God. But Felix, on the other hand, utilizes the scripture to answer these, and he utilizes a redeemed reasoning to answer these. So for those of you who are out there and your cup of tea for reading is a systematic theology, there is something in this book for you. For those of you who would rather read something like C.S. Lewis's Narnia, or maybe you're out reading The Hobbit and you like the action and the adventure and you like the fiction, there is something in here for you too. I think that this book really has something for for everyone, certainly because it contains a lot of scriptural quotes, but it's done through a very natural dialogue between Dante and Felix. So again, the book is called Among the Vesper Spires by Pastor Gregory Graybill. He has a doctorate in philosophy from Oxford. According to his bio, he pastors in Illinois, right there on the Mississippi River, right adjacent to Iowa, if you're ever in that area and need to swing in for a church service. Based on the book, I would definitely recommend that. And one last funny thing that I want to tell you how much I like it. I originally bought the Kindle version so that I would just have immediate access to it, but as I read, I decided that I wanted a hard copy. So I also had a hard copy sent to my house of Among the Vesper Spires, Eternally Enjoy for a Day's Exercise on the Earth from Pastor Gregory Graybill. If you're interested in this book, I will go ahead and put a link in the show notes you can click on, and then you'll have your options for purchase there. I recommend that as it goes through the Westminster Larger Catechism questions 1 through 90, and that's also where we find ourselves now as we get to continue in getting to know our great God. So here we go with Westminster Larger Catechism question 7. So I'm going to ask it, and I'm going to give the full answer, and then I'll explain our outline for today in an episode that I am really excited to get into. So question 7 of the Westminster Larger Catechism asks, What is God? Answer. God is a spirit in 
and of himself infinite in being, glory, blessedness, and perfection, all-sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, incomprehensible, everywhere present, almighty, knowing all things, most wise, most holy, most just, most merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Our outline for today will be simple. Number one, we're going to define and discuss blessedness. Number two, we will define and discuss perfection. And then number three, we're going to connect them to each other. And what's funny about number three is that it's kind of intertwined or interwoven throughout number one and number two. Again, we're focusing on the question, what is God? In previous episodes, we've covered that God is a spirit that God is infinite, and we have specifically in another episode discussed that God is infinite in being and glory. Today, we discuss, as the title of the episode suggests, God's blessedness and perfection. So let's begin with the term blessedness. Now, I want to warn you that we're probably going to discuss a little bit of church history, probably more than we really have in this series so far, but we want to define the term blessedness. Now, to do that, we are going to look at a man by the name of James Usher. For those of you who may not know James Usher, what I have done is found what I estimate to be a very helpful paragraph on him that comes from an article by Harrison Perkins out of the Confessional Presbyterian Journal. The article is titled Archbishop James Usher, 1581 to 1656. I'll also put the title of this article in the show notes so that you can see what I'm referencing, but I want you to get a good idea of who James Usher is, and I'm only going to really give one quote from him, but it is a definition of blessedness. I'll mention another gentleman in addition to James Usher here in a little bit, but I wanted to explain to you how I came to find James Usher and the other gentleman that we'll mention momentarily, but that's because when we see the word blessedness, what I was really trying to do in preparation for this episode is is go back to the 17th century and really get a good idea for the theological term blessedness. What did they mean by blessedness? Because my inclination was the way that we use the term blessed or blessing or even blessedness in a 21st century context really isn't quite what the Westminster divines were getting at when they pinned the Westminster Larger Catechism. And that's that's what I found out. And it's important for us to, as best that we can, to get the authorial intent of those who wrote the Westminster Confession of Faith. And certainly when we read that text, which is inspired, the Word of God, we, we also do our best to understand the context of what we're reading and the context that the author wrote in. So utilizing that same hermeneutical principle, Coming here to the Westminster Larger Catechism, I ran into James Usher, who gives us a really good quote on the term blessedness. The article that I referenced, the Archbishop James Usher by Harrison Perkins, has a really good introductory paragraph for us to see who James Usher was. Here is what we read. Quote, James Usher, the 17th century Archbishop of Armagh, is arguably the foremost voice for Reformed theology in the entire history of the Church in Ireland and one of the more significant figures for Reformed theology in England as well. Despite his theological prowess in the early modern period, Usher is now usually most associated with debates about the doctrine of creation and the age of the earth. Although world chronology was certainly one of his interests, it would be a shame to limit Usher's importance to such a narrow issue. Usher strove for real reformation in established churches of Ireland and England, continually and fiercely refuted Roman Catholic doctrine and carried sway with some of the most prominent figures in 17th century Presbyterianism. Usher is, therefore, worth wide-ranging consideration. So that's just the introductory paragraph, and I have looked through this article and found some very interesting things about James Usher. Again, I'll put it in the show notes if you are interested. But he is worth wide-ranging consideration. And so today we want to employ that. We want to consider what James Usher has to say about the blessedness of God. Again, very influential in Ireland, very influential in England. Someone who, in my estimation, has a good sense of what the word blessedness means from the Westminster Larger Catechism, question seven, when we affirm that God is infinite in blessedness. So what is this quote? James Usher defines the blessedness of God, saying this, quote, it is the property of God whereby he hath all fullness of delight and contentment in himself. God's blessedness is the property of God, whereby he hath all fullness of delight and contentment in himself. So what I hope you can do now is take James Usher's quote 
and think of God's delight and contentment in himself, delight and contentment, we're going to see that God's happiness or delight and contentment are really connected to his blessedness. It's almost as if they are synonymous terms. So James Usher, one more time, says that God's blessedness is the property of God whereby he hath all fullness of delight and contentment in himself, which leads me to bring up another individual by the name of Edward Pierce. Now, Edward Pierce, very, very interesting individual right in the 17th century, and we're going to discuss his history perhaps more than we're going to quote his readings today. But funny thing, and maybe you can re- you can resonate with this, but lately I've heard a lot of theologians, scholars, podcasters, preachers really urge God's people, don't simply read about the Reformers or the Patristics, but go and read the Reformers and the Patristics. And the funny thing about Edward Pierce is I couldn't really find a whole lot written about him. I was able to find vastly more original works than modern works that commented about him. So we will certainly be taking the advice of those that say not just read the Reformers and the Patristics, or not just read about the Reformers and the Patristics, but read their original works. That's kind of almost all that's available about Edward Pierce. Now, really, really fast side note. I don't think that there's necessarily a dichotomy between uh, the original works of the Reformers and the Patristics and the modern writings about them. I think the way that they work best in tandem is when we read the original folks, like when we're reading Calvin's Institutes and we don't quite understand it as well as we would like, then that's when we rely on the modern writers to provide clarity on the original work. And that's that's how I think that the two don't have to be in dichotomy. So it's good to read the originals, of course. And when we don't understand, we read the modern to give us a little better understanding of what we're reading. I digress from that. So like I said, Edward Pierce, I really could not find much about him. I was able to find more of his original work. But I want to shout out to Brother Kyle Rose, because he did some research for me when trying to dig up a little bit about Edward Pierce. Now, Kyle, he is what I like to call around the Reformed Confessional Corner, the gatekeeper. Uh, He, again, helped me with this research, and he helps us to maintain good, sound doctrine on our website at reformedconfess.com, in case you didn't know. But he helps us to not put heretical things out to the public forum, and he contributes in many ways of wisdom. He's a great brother in the faith, but also Kyle Rose, he has a very formidable reformed beard. So again, Kyle, thanks for the research. And what Kyle was able to lend me was some information from two different sources, and I'll put the titles of those in the show notes. The information about Edward Pierce, who's going to help us grasp the blessedness of God. Uh, One of the books that Kyle sent me was A Biographical History of England by James Granger. And then there is a title, Meet the Puritans by Joel Beakey and Randall Peterson. So the information I'm going to tell you about Edward Pierce, kind of like I did with James Usher, is going to come from those two resources. And then we will add to James Usher's definition uh, that God's blessedness it is the property whereby he hath fullness of delight and contentment in himself. So Edward Pierce, here we go. He received a Bachelor's of Arts degree from St. John's College in 1654. So again, I found Edward Pierce because I'm trying to hold a lot of fidelity to the term blessedness in the 1646-1647 context. So we see just a few seven or so years later, Edward Pierce receives his Bachelor's of Arts degree from St. John's. And then three years after that, in 1657, at the very young age of 24, he was appointed preacher at St. Margaret's Westminster. That's the historic church that's adjacent to the Westminster Abbey there in London, England. And also he became lecturer in 1658 at Westminster Abbey. So we have this man. We understand that he's 24 years old. He's preaching at a church in Westminster. So we know that he is familiar with the language written within the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Catechisms. In terms of his preaching ministry, there is reference to him calling him a most affectionate and useful preacher. But he was ejected from St. Margaret's in about 1660. So this is when the Act of Uniformity took place and Pierce was ejected from being a nonconformist. And unfortunately, this man only lived to be 40 years old. He died of tuberculosis. And and one of the quotes that really stands out to me today in light of what we're about to share pertaining to the Westminster Larger Catechism is that when Pierce knew his death was imminent, one of the things that he prayed was that some of his work might be useful after 
his death. Certainly, he had goals that he didn't achieve in his lifetime, and I'm really excited to get to be a part of an answer to that prayer, as we're going to rely on some of his work being useful several centuries after his death. So that's really what I could dig up on who Edward Pierce is, someone who came into a pastor at a young age of 24 at St. Margaret's and was ejected for apparently being a nonconformist. Well, now I want to bring to you some of the original work of Edward Pierce, who helps develop James Usher's definition of God's blessedness. Again, we're asking, what is God? And we know that God is infinite in blessedness. James Usher, 17th century theologian from Ireland, says that it is the property whereby he hath fullness of delight and contentment in himself. So what does Edward Pierce do? So as much as James Usher defines the blessedness of God, Edward Pierce describes the blessedness of God. And here's how he does that in a very Puritan-esque titled book. And (laughs) bear with me. I'm going to take a deep breath and read this very long title with you. Uh, Brother Nick always jokes that sometimes he's going to put his articles out on the website and just have these very descriptive titles like the Puritans did. So we'll, we'll see, Nick. We'll hold you that and Maybe we'll have to maybe we'll have to do a blogcast over one of those articles. Now check this long, uh, check this long title out. So here it is from Edward Pierce: "Quote a beam of divine glory, or the unchangeableness of God, opened, vindicated, and improved, whereunto is added the soul's rest in God." That's the title of this work. So that's a long title: "A beam of divine glory, or the unchangeableness of God, opened, vindicated, and improved, whereunto is added." the soul's rest in God. So in this work, which by the way, as someone who hails from Ohio, it just, I I have to be humble and say, this is available at Michigan's library website, the University of Michigan, Michigan michigan.edu. I was really just taking a shot to see where I could find it at and there it was. So thank you, Wolverines. I think it's the first time I've ever thanked uh, the state of Michigan and their university for anything. Ooh, and and I hear it's beautiful in Grand Rapids. Anyway, (laughs) here nor there, uh, Edward Pierce, in this long titled work, he he has some sections, and one of them is uh, it's about God being unchangeable or immutable. And one of the things that Pierce writes that God is immutable in is his blessedness and glory. Now, where else have we in this series seen the words glory and blessedness put side by side? Aha. Uh-huh. The answer to question 7 of Westminster Larger Catechism puts the words glory and blessedness side by side. It says God is a spirit in and of himself, infinite in being, glory, blessedness, and perfection. So right there we see what I infer is that this document, question 7 of Westminster Larger Catechism, influenced Edward Pierce. And I'm just picking that up, inferring that by seeing where there is blessedness mentioned, there is also glory mentioned. So that's why I think one of the reasons why I think Edward Pierce is very qualified to give us a good feel for what the term blessedness in the Westminster Larger Catechism means in its 17th century context. So here are some of the things that he says in the section, God is unchangeable in his blessedness and glory. Well, first and foremost, he references 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, and I'm going to read that for us, but not before I get a sip of my blueberry tea with a little bit of heavy whipping cream. All right, then the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and upon that scriptural basis, Edward Pierce writes, quote, he is blessed And that not only objectively, as he is the great object of the praises, blessings, and admirings of men and angels forever, nor yet as he is the spring and fountain of all that blessedness which the one and the other of them do eternally enjoy, but subjectively, being a God infinitely blessed and happy. Now again, two things just happened there. He is claiming that God is infinitely blessed, which echoes the Westminster Larger Catechism, question seven, God is infinite in blessedness. But then also, did you notice how he uses the word happy? And I told you probably 10 or 15 minutes ago, James Usher's definition of blessedness has to do with delight and contentment. He says that God, the blessedness is defined as the property of God, whereby he hath all fullness of delight and contentment in himself. So blessedness is this idea of delight and contentment And what Pierce says is it has to do with happiness. And that comes up over and over again in Pierce's discussion. Pierce continues saying, quote, God is the most happy and blessed being. He is so blessed that tis more than all the creatures, whether men or angels, 
can do to add the least tittle or iota to his blessedness. Hence we read from Psalm chapter 16, verse 2, that their goodness extendeth not to him. And again, can a man be profitable unto God, or is it gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? Now the next few statements that Edward Pierce makes in this work start to intermingle this idea of blessedness and happiness with God's perfection. And so you can really see how the Westminster Larger Catechism, from my estimation, impacts Pierce's writing and thinking. Pierce says the following, quote, that is, tis no profit, no gain to God, no addition to his happiness or perfection that we or any are or do so. He continues and on and says that God is never the more happy or unhappy by anything the creature does or can do. And he references Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 5 saying, quote, He is exalted above all blessing and praise. So again, what we see is Usher he defines God's blessedness as the fullness of delight and contentment within himself. And Pierce develops that and explains it by tying together the idea that God is infinitely blessed or he is happy. And then he starts to intermingle God's perfection. So what we would ask is what does God's blessedness have to do with perfection? Well, catch this, catch the the words blessed, happy, and perfect here in this quote as I continue on with the same work from Edward Pierce. And in case you forgot the name of that work, it's A Beam of Divine Glory or The Unchangeableness of God Open, Vindicated, and Improved, whereunto is added the soul's rest in God. And of course, I'm just being silly because it's a huge title. But in the same work, just a few lines down, he says, Quote, God cannot make himself more blessed, happy, and perfect than he is. Nothing can by infiniteness be added unto infiniteness. Now, as he is thus blessed, so his blessedness is unchangeable. Hence, one of his names is, overall, God blessed forevermore. Romans chapter 9, verse 5. I could continue reading, but for time's sake, I will not. There's a, a continual tying in of God's blessedness with happiness. And that blessedness is tied with perfection. And again and again and again, if you read Piers, you'll see the terms blessedness, perfection, and glory all come up successively. Where else do we see those terms come up right next to each other one after another? That is in the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 7, answer 7, that says God is a spirit in and of himself infinite in, ready? So infinite, you just heard Pierce mention God's infinity and his blessedness over and over again. He's infinite in being, glory, blessedness, and perfection. So the more that I read Pierce, the more I really am convinced that he was influenced by the Westminster Larger Catechism, specifically question 7, and that makes him, in my estimation, very qualified again, with his preaching credentials, to give us a flavor of what we mean by blessedness. So in very short review of that, before we define perfection, remember, we said we were going to define and discuss blessedness. Well, we defined it with James Usher, and we have discussed it and developed it a little bit further with Edward Pierce. If you were concisely asked, what does it mean that God is infinite in blessedness? Well, we would say that there are no limitations on God's complete delight and contentment in himself. There are no limitations on God's complete delight and contentment in himself. That is how we would answer that. And with that, what you saw with Pierce is he w- he kept referencing perfection right there next to blessedness. So what do we do with that? How do we proceed with that? Well, what I want to do is define perfection for you, God's perfection specifically. And to do that, we will rely on someone who has become a bit of a staple in this series, and that is none other than Louis Burkhoff. So I'm going to fumble my books for a moment. And we are in Louis Burkhoff's Systematic Theology for me in this old copy that I was blessed with from my pastor, Ed Poppy in Guam. Thank you, Pastor Ed. I am on page 59, turning over to page 60, under the heading, The Infinity of God. Now, very fittingly for us, the Westminster Larger Catechism says that God is infinite in perfection. And here, Louis Burkhoff writes under a subheading, His Absolute Perfection. So let's see, now that we've seen what blessedness is, We've looked at James Usher and Edward Pierce's works, who were familiar with that 17th century term. Let's look and see how Louis Burkhoff describes God's perfection. He says, quote, This is the infinity of the divine being considered in itself. It should not be understood in a quantitative, but in a qualitative sense. It qualifies all the communicable attributes of God. 
Infinite power is not an absolute quantum, but an exhaustless potency of power. And infinite holiness is not a boundless quantum of holiness, but a holiness which is, qualitatively, free from all limitation or defect. The same may be said of infinite knowledge and wisdom, and of infinite love and righteousness. Says Dr. Orr, quote, Perhaps we can say that infinity in God is ultimately, a, internally and qualitatively, absence of all limitation and defect, b, boundless potentiality. In this sense of the word, the infinity of God is simply identical with the perfection of his divine being. Scripture proof for it is found in Job chapter 11, verses 7 through 10, Psalm chapter 145, verse 3, and Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. So that is how Louis Burkhoff discusses the absolute perfection of God. Now, for those of you who may be wondering, what we can gather from that, when we think about that God is infinite in perfection, it is it is a quality. Now, he says qualitative. I grew up in the Navy learning qualitative analysis. We did, you know, arrow goes up, therefore the next arrow goes down, pertaining to electrical theory. So that was very helpful. That's, that's the flashbacks I had there. What Lewis Burkhoff here is asserting is that we, we cannot quantify God's perfection, but rather we view it as quality that permeates the rest of his attributes. God's perfection is infinite. There are no limitations. Now you take perfect and let's use it like an adjective. We would say that he has perfect love. We are using perfect to describe the love. He has perfect knowledge, perfect justice, perfect wisdom, perfect grace, perfect mercy. So it is a way that we think about God. All the things that he is can be described as perfect. Therefore, one of the ways that we can describe him overall is perfect. So he is infinite. There are no limitations on his flawlessness. You cannot add, you cannot take away. He is the very standard and essence of what we are aiming to be when we say we are being sanctified. We are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. Well, what is the end point in mind? We are aiming to be not God himself, but like God, for he is perfection. So I hope that that is intuitive to you, that it is not simply just saying that God is perfect first and foremost, but when we observe his communicable attributes, they can be described as perfect, every single one of them. So it would reason to say that if the sum total of his attributes, so far as the human mind can comprehend, are perfect, then he overall is perfect. His perfection is without limitation. So with that, we come to an end of the first line of the Westminster Larger Catechism, question seven. So far, we have said that God is a spirit in and of himself, infinite in being, glory. And then today we discussed blessedness and perfection. Next time we come back, I'm not quite sure how we'll, how far we will get, but we will start to look at the terms all-sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, and so forth. So thank you for tuning in where we get to know our great God so that one, we can worship him according to who he is and to how he desires. I would ask you that if you have enjoyed this series, if this is helping you in your walk with God, please reach out and share it with a friend. You can leave us feedback on whatever podcast forum you are. Give us a rating. Give us a comment. Again, we have material that seems to be helping many people day in and day out at our website, reformconfess.com. Thank you so much. And with that, we will see you next time in October. God bless you. Thank you.